Hi guys, and welcome to the new Blender release overview for Blender 2.78. Blender releases come and pass, but every so often some very special additions all combine into a Blender release and make it extra significant. This is one of those releases, so let's get stuck into some of the new features. First off, we have Chris with the modeling and add-ons updates. Hey, this is Chris Plush for CG Masters, and I'm going to be taking you through some of the new modeling changes to this new Blender release. So in the release notes, I'm going to head over to the modeling section and see what that has in store for us. Now, the first thing I'll mention is the decimate modifier, which supports n-gons now. In 2.77, if you decimated an object with n-gons, it resulted in some weird funky shapes because they didn't really know how to deal with them. But in 2.78, that's all fixed and n-gons decimate nice and clean now. now. Let's move down to the curve editing additions now including a new freehand curve drawing tool which gives you the freedom to sketch out your own curves. And that also includes options for drawing these curves directly on top of surfaces and also sticking out of those surfaces, like for example, hair strands. If you wanna learn more about this add-on and all of its options, you can check out Campbell's video, Freehand Sketching in Blender by following the link in the release notes. Now some honorable mentions under the selection category. Path Select now has an option to fill region. In order to use this tool, you simply right click on a vertex, a face, or an edge, and then hold control, shift, and then right click on another face or vertex or edge, and it'll select the entire region between them. Now let's move on and go over some of the updates and additions to the add-ons for Blender. And we'll start off with a good one called Archimesh. This is a really cool add-on that allows you to easily and simply create lots of different architectural elements like rooms and doors, columns, and lots of different props like shelves and books and things like that. And then going down the list, we have a new add-on called Measure It, which allows you to not only display measurements and notes for your models, but also allows you to render them out as well. If you want to see more about that, you can check out these two videos here that show you all the different options for that. Now we'll move on to the Object Boolean Tools by Vitor Balbio and Mikhail Rachinsky. This add-on makes the Boolean Tools easily accessible in the left side toolbar and offers additional options such as quickly creating custom poly brushes to use in your Boolean operations. Next up is the Carver add-on by Pixivore and Clark X. This is another Boolean type add-on that among other things makes it very easy to chop up your objects using different shapes like cubes, circles, and custom shapes. Also known as the Swiss cheese add-on. Now we move on to the modifier tools add-on, which is just a small collection of tools for managing modifiers. And I've already enabled that modifier in this example here. And you can see at the top of the modifier stack, we have just a few new options here to work with including toggling visibility for all the modifiers and also expanding or collapsing them all as well. Next we have Oscar Art Tools add-on created by Oscar Art. It's a studio utilities add-on that as described gives users an insight into the studio tools created by Oscar Art for use in his professional works. And let me give you a quick preview of how all that looks. There's actually quite a few tools in this add-on. So I've already enabled the add-on and in, in the left side toolbar, it creates a new tab for you called Oscar Art Tools. So each one of these menus has a selection of tools. Some of them are new tools it looks like, and then some are just easier to access tools placed in these menus. And if you wanna see a full rundown of everything about these tools, you can see the full documentation on this page here. Now the next add-on is called Material Utils and Conversion. This is an add-on that allows you to convert Blender internal materials to cycles and vice versa. And it also allows you to extract procedural textures from Blender internal and create images out of them so that you can use those images with cycles or with a sculpt brush or a paintbrush. So down here we have updated add-ons, which is a whole list of just updates to existing add-ons that I'll briefly go through. The 3D view navigation add-on now has options to pan, zoom, and rotate in your 3D view. The landscape add-on has had some updates including planet noise option. The dynamic spacebar menu has had some format changes to it. The extra objects add-on now has some new objects in it such as beam builder which helps you create construction beams like I-beams a little more quickly. The node wrangler has some additions to it. And going down the list, the Object Cloud Generator now has cycle support. There have been some updates and fixes to the Pi Menus add-on, the Sapling Tree Generator, 
extra curve objects add-on, and the Pavre exporter. And I cannot believe Pavre still exists. That's pretty cool. That's a piece of history for you right there, kids. That ray tracer is probably as old as I am. It's very cool to see that it's still around. And that'll do it for the overview of the add-ons for Blender 2.78. Lee here again, and let's go through some of the Cycles additions coming into the new release. Dalai Falinto has been working on a multi-view project at the Blender Institute, and it's now ready and officially implemented into Blender 2.78. To get this set up yourself, just open up Blender 2.78 and make sure you're in the Cycles render mode. We're going to come and turn on Views in the Scene buttons. This will set us up for Stereo 3D or multi-view. So in this case, I'll choose multi-view. And then we just need to change a few of the camera settings. So I'll select uh, the camera that I'd like, go to the camera properties. I'm gonna change the lens to panoramic. We're going to make the type equirectangular. So now that we'll have a 360 degree camera on rendering. Now to complete the 3D effect, we need a right and left camera. So I'm going to name the current camera that I have here, underscore L. I'll then duplicate it. Now I can just move it over a little as well. And then with it still selected, I'll rename that with underscore R. So the visualization is really cool. It will automatically uh, dive into it in the viewport. And now to render in multi-view, we just need to uncheck either the right or the left camera, render one, and then save it. And then I can render the other camera, save both, and you're ready to go. An array of optimizations for cycles has been added, furthering the increase in speeds with more types of objects and effects. So we have things like BVH build being multi-threaded, and that speeds up this bit, by the way. And these BVH optimizations are found through different areas of cycles for different material and object types. A BVH stands for bounding volume hierarchy, and you can compare how it looks on the left here in contrast with Octree on the right. Some GPU rendering specific features that have been added include uh, the GTX 980 Ti and Titan X. Uh, performance issues have been solved, and a huge deal now, we have support for the NVIDIA GTX 10 series cards. So that includes the 1080, 1070, and 1060. So actually, I just got myself a GTX 1060 the other day. Uh, this one is the MSI Gaming X. Uh, it's fantastic timing. And to go along with this, we have empty scene and area optimization. So that means that empty or almost empty scenes render pretty much twice as fast. And GPU rendering now supports bindless textures. So that means that the texture limit is lifted and only limited by your graphics card's VRAM or memory. If we move to the viewport, and we now have procedural textures in Cycles Material mode that will allow you to view them just like image textures uh, before render. So if I compare 2.77 here in Material mode, you can see them viewing nicely in the viewport in 2.78. Oh, also, bump mapping in viewport and this is in material mode again before render. Just awesome. Now this one always got me hitting shift Z to go into rendered viewport mode. Now when you press shift Z again, it will toggle back to the previous shading mode you had in the viewport before. For example, material mode. Okay, hold everything. This is cool. Adaptive subdivision and subdivision and displacement in general in cycles has been completely updated. A lot of limitations have been fixed. Now, this is still an experimental feature, so to activate it, just open up Blender, switch to the Cycles Render, and then we'll also come to this pop-up menu here and include in experimental support. So now you'll see over in the uh, subdivision modifier, you'll see the adaptive checkbox there. Uh, with that checked on, using this demo scene, you'll see a dicing scale parameter. That's based on pixels, and it will allow the adaptive subdivisions to increase or decrease closer or further away to the camera. In terms of physics updates, ClothSim now has a dynamic base mesh. This is fantastic for moving the base of the cloth along with the simulation as well. It just gives you more control. Making a return also is the cloth speed effect. I use this so much when we had it before and it's really helpful for big changes in character motion from slower to faster. And the cloth simulation will just catch up, get past those moments so it can continue uh, the physics without being a huge drag behind or even getting launched out of collision objects. Really cool. Attention. Grease Pencil is now officially so awesome, it is becoming its own alternative for 2D animators. So originally, Grease Pencil was intended to just be an overlay annotation feature for Blender. But the amount of amazing use by 2D animators and artists has really made this tool stand out on its own. And all of these features are coming in uh, to assist with artists and all the great work that they're doing with it. Daniel M. Lara, known as Pepeland, 
Absolutely knocks it out of the park again with the demonstration, of some of the new layering tools, and especially now you can parent uh, grease pencil layers to different bones or objects to allow a really nice bone or object driven animation for the 2D drawn elements. Just awesome. On the topic of animation, Allegorath, aka Joshua Lung, has dived back into some more development work for Blender, and I can instantly feel the improvements here. B-Bones, or Bendy Bones, have been updated and are now easy to use, allowing more control over modifying the sub-bones with properties rather than relying on the bones above and below it. You can now have a curved rest position. This is great for mouths, eyelids, and such. Check for more information on this on the release notes, or Allegorath's blog as well, with lots of great uh, behind the scenes and uh, showing his working. Next up, we also have some drivers updates, including a really cool new eyedropper tool. This will really save me some time. So rather than manually adding drivers every time, you can now hover over uh, any of the properties that you'd like. Uh, let's here go to rotation, and then just hit Control D. This will bring up a menu which will allow you to add uh, drivers in a certain way. So I might choose all from target, so that's all of the rotations. And then I'll select a target. For this test, let's choose the X location. So this will now automatically set up the driver uh, no fuss, and of course, the graph editor drivers panel is there to do any extra modifications. For example, I can increase the uh, rotation amount per uh, distance of X location. Some characters can have way more than even a hundred uh, drivers, so this would be a great speed up. So from here, I'm going to pass to 80, who will be going over UI, real time, and other miscellaneous features that have made their way into this Blender release. Hey, this is AD Burrows at CG Masters. Let's take a look over some Blender 2.78. Thanks to Sergey, we've got a new waveform visualizer for color grading. To show this, I've got two image editors open here, but one I'm set to view to show you the sidebar scopes tab, while in the left hand side I can paint. Normally in Blender 2.77, we have these split RG and B channels view options side by side called red, green, and blue. We can see where all the color is on each channel. On the green channel, you can see we've got a lot of green in the image on the left hand side. In 2.78, this red, green, blue option has been renamed to Parade, which is the industry standard term for this sort of view. We've now got a new red, green, blue option, which displays all channels overlaid. It should be apparent whereabouts on my image I have all my dark red if I paint in between the green and the blue, and a little more on the right hand side here. Thanks to Phil Ghosh as part of his Google Summer of Code UV project. He asked for suggestions. Uh, I asked for finer controls for incremental snapping and almost immediately he managed to add an improvement. Now when set to incremental settings and you hold control while moving the vertex, it'll snap to 16 positions along the grid instead of just eight. Or if holding shift and control for finer movements, we can snap to 32 positions along the grid. You may have seen the PBR shader tests that I've been doing for the Blender internal viewport. It's thanks to these three additions by Alexander Romanov from the Blend for Web team that it's possible. The normal map node for Blender internal simplifies things down immensely. And here I've got a simple low poly cube with smooth shaded normals. And I'll bake the normals of this high poly object onto the low poly. So with the layers on I need, I'll select the high, then shift select the low and I'm making sure selected to active is enabled and then I'm just going to click bake. In the node editor I've got this texture node hooked up to some UVs. I'm just going to select the texture in the pull down and here's the new node that we want, normal map node. I'm just going to hook it up and we're almost done. In the viewport you can see the low poly isn't quite shading like the high poly is. So what we'll need is to add a gamma node and set this to 0.454 and now it shades perfectly. Basically, the normal maps are non-color data and so need to be treated linearly. Uh, that's what the gamma node is converting for us. Or at least that's what I think is happening anyway. Another addition is we have some real-time environment lighting now, which means we can give it an overall white light cast or choose to give it a sky and ground color light bounce. And the big thing is the environment maps which use these cube map textures. These can now be used as nodes. Because they're in the nodes, we can mix between them based on roughness settings and simulate the energy conservation of a typical PBR shader. No support for equirectangular maps as yet though, which would of course simplify things even further. Another very cool thing if you're working between programs is the Alembic support. Here I've got a cube that's been subdivided a little and beveled at the edges. Then it's getting some more subdivisions that you can see in the modifier stack. In between the subdivision modifiers, I'm using cloth physics set to the rubber preset. 
I've also given this some self-collision, otherwise this is all default stuff. The plane just has collision physics and again all default settings. Now I can just run the simulation with Alt A and we'll see it crumple onto the plane. Now I can go to export out using the Alembic format. I'll set it to use those 30 frames. I'm going to take this into Unreal Engine 4 so I'm going to scale up by 100 and just export the selected cube object only. I'm also going to set everything enabled here and then hit export. Over in Unreal, I'd have just a really basic default scene. I'll hit import in the content browser. Select the file and for the import type, since we have the simulation, I'm going to choose skeletal rather than the experimental option. There may be a problem with normals at the moment, so I'm selecting to force one smoothing group, which should look okay. Then we'll see it pop up in the content browser. When we double click the animation file, we'll see the simulation, though we'll need to fix the axis. I'm just going to drag this into the scene. I'm going to rotate it around 90 degrees on X and reposition it. I'll also drop a simple metal material onto it. And then when we hit play, we can see the simulation currently looping. You can read through all the details and ways to utilize these fantastic features for 2.78 in the release notes link below. So for now we wait patiently, or not so patiently thanks to these release candidate builds. And if you are watching this before the final release, give it a download, play around with it, and report any issues you might find to developer.blender.org. That will help them get rid of any bugs before the final release. Also, let us know some of the cool features uh, you found useful in the comments. Some of these tools have hardly been field tested in larger amounts, and there's really a lot to discover. So, happy blending, guys, and as is tradition, let's have some fun trying out all these new cool features.